co-founder and CEO of MSH Talent and Technology Solutions. Um, his firm's been around for about a decade. 12 years. Wow, yeah, that's wow. amazing. Um, and they have offices in mo multiple locations in the United States, but also internationally. Um, they specialize in building talent and technology solutions um, for clients that are businesses all the way from a startup size up to a massive enterprise level um, business. And prior to starting MSH, um, Oz worked in technology project management for a Fortune 500 company. Um, he graduated from the University of Arizona and has a wife and four kids. You're stealing in, some of my material right now. But well, you know, in, in Parkland, Florida. So I am trying to entice Oz to have Nashville as like home or second home. We I'm have not going to lie. We love, we love Nashville. They do have an office here. Okay, so then I'm not going to talk at all about what you are going to talk about. I'll, I'll take leave, care. I'm going to leave that for you. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Everybody welcome Oz. Hi, everyone. My name is Oz Rashid. I am the CEO and founder of The Message. We'll get into my background in the company in just a little bit, but I want to tell you the main reason I'm here. It's because I believe everybody deserves to love what they do for work. But that seems more unrealistic now than maybe ever. Between quiet quitting, the great resignation, tech layoffs, it's getting harder and harder to find people fulfilled with their work. And I think that's a shame, right? We spend so much of our lives working, right? The average American goes into the workforce at 22, works 40 to 50 hours a week, retires at 65. That's too long to not love your work, to not like the people you work with, and to serve a mission that you just don't believe in. I think we've all heard that when it comes to sleep, we spend one third of our lives sleeping. So staying in a bad job is akin to knowing that you spend 33% of your life asleep and sleeping on a bed of rocks. Not only would that be a bad way to sleep, it would be a really bad quality of life. So I wanted to come here today because I've spent a lot of my career advising companies, thousands, Fortune 500 to startups on best hiring practices, but I'm really passionate about helping individuals. And hopefully I can help some of you around how to identify what kind of company you want to work at, why you want to work there, and one that's going to give you meaning. But before I get into the presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about why I'm so passionate about this subject, my origin story. So I did not start my career in HR and recruiting. I started my career in information technology as a project manager. And I got promoted a couple different times. And I got, uh, at the ripe old age of 24, they gave me the ability to hire. I was really excited about this. I was also a little bit concerned because I didn't know anything about hiring. And so I reached out to a couple people that I trusted at the company I worked at and asked them, what do I do? And they gave me the name of a couple recruiting companies and said, listen, you're gonna reach out to these companies. You're gonna tell them the role that you're working on they're going to present some candidates for you, and if they actually get the job, then we're going to pay them a fee. I said, okay, that sounds simple enough. But they said, Oz, I'm going to warn you, you're going to be underwhelmed. I thought about it, and I said, all right, I'll be open-minded. So I reached out to these companies, started working with them, spent a lot of time up front talking about the role and what I wanted and my expectations, and very quickly, I found out they were right. I was pretty underwhelmed. They didn't show up on time, they weren't on point, the candidates weren't of high quality, the worst thing was, they treated it like a transaction. I felt like I was buying a used Rolex in Times Square and dealing with it. And that just didn't make a lot of sense to me. I mean, this seems to be something really important, right? When you start new work. I thought about it from my perspective as a 24-year-old hiring manager. My ability to get promoted and get a raise was at least in part due to the type of people that we brought into the organization, right? And then I thought about it from my company's perspective. The difference between being number one and number 10 in your industry, a lot of times, is the type of people you bring into your organization. And then, I thought about it from the individual perspective. Now, this might be some of us, or might be somebody we know, but we've all known people that have been struggling with where they work, or maybe they were laid off, or maybe they can't pay their bills. And they're looking, you know, this can be a life-changing thing. They're interviewing, and they want to get the role that they want, and that can change everything. It can change your development, it can change your compensation, it can change your relationships, and yet, it's in the hands of somebody that's treating it like a commodity. And I don't think that's right. And so hopefully today, and so a lot's happened in the last 12 to 15 years to lead us up to this point, but today, I want to talk about how we can help you as individuals identify what you're looking for out of an employer and make sure you make a good decision, because I think it's that important. I'm not going to say that I think what we do in recruiting is at the highest levels of giving back to the community. I think that's teachers, I think that's nurses, firemen, um, policemen, but I do think it's just a level below. 
I'm that passionate about it. And I think when it's done right, it really changes lives in a very, very positive way. So today's presentation is entitled Swipe Right on Your Next Employer, Finding Your Perfect Match. Now, a little aside on the presentation. So about two months ago, Yesenia came to me and said, can you go and help us out with the Wondery? We talked about the topic and the content. And so I had to think of a name, so I came up with a name. I asked a couple of people at MSH, what do you think about this name? They gave me a thumbs up, it's real good. I said, okay. So I handed, I, we went ahead and put it out there. It was posted online for everybody to see. I was feeling really good about myself. And then uh, about a week ago, I was sitting at the dinner table. I had three daughters. The oldest is 11, her name is Kayla. Total teenager at this point. And I'm there with my wife. And my wife asked me, what is the name of the presentation? And I said, she said, what is the name of the presentation? And I said, swipe right on your next employer. Before my wife could even respond, my daughter screams out, Dad, that is so cringe. And so I immediately felt like this. Can I give us a second? Don't worry about it. Okay. There you go. How do you do, fellow kids? And at this time, Sammy, our director of people operations, asked me, what does that mean from? And I said, 30 Rock, which is a show that aired back in 2006, where a lot of you were toddlers at that time. So I'm probably hopelessly outdated and um, lost all credibility, but hopefully I can get it back throughout the course of the presentation. Let's move on to the agenda. All right, so I use dating analogies a lot. I have for years. I do think finding your perfect mate is a lot like finding your perfect job and role. So for an agenda, who am I? A little bit about me. Are you here for the right reasons? Your perfect match checklist, mutual relationships, can we make this last? Red flags, speed dating, and ready to find the one. All right, a couple highlights up here. So that's me again, Azrashid. The company that we brought up earlier is MSH. MSH has three businesses. Our first business is Talent Solutions, and it's disrupting that recruitment industry that we were talking about earlier. All full-time hiring within that space. One person, a thousand people, outsourcing, talent acquisition altogether. Our second business is technology solutions, which is more traditional consulting, so project-based work, building teams for companies that help solve technology challenges. And then our third business, it's the smallest right now, but we hope it's gonna be the biggest. It's our HR software platform by the name of Aon. And what we hope Aon does is gonna transform the recruitment space from a technology perspective. So we're getting ready to release that in quarter two of next year. We are really excited about it. Uh, AEONHire.com to take a look and follow along. We think that it's going to do something really, really special, and it's going to be a great synergy with our other businesses. A couple other things I'll highlight here. I am Indian American, not American Indian. I get asked this a lot. My dad is blonde and blue-eyed German. My mom is brown and brown-eyed Indian. I was born in California, Arizona raised, but I've lived in Florida since 2005. And the only other thing I'll draw you to is I love Mexican food. So if you have good recommendations, please let me know at the end of the presentation. One other thing I want to point out here, if there's anything you write down from this presentation, it would be this email right here. Because I think that what we're going to talk about is not always linear, right? Some of you it might be very pertinent to right now. Some of you it might not be pertinent for many years. And so what I'd ask is, write down my email, and if at any point you have any question around going through a hiring process, putting together a resume, questions to ask in an interview, if you put in the subject line, Vanderbilt Talk Follow-Up, at any point, I promise you I will answer you. It could be 2023, it could be 2033, it doesn't matter. I'm very passionate about this space and I would love to help anybody if they have questions. All right, enough about me. Let's talk about you. So let's get a row of hands in here. Who is a student currently? Okay. Who has had an internship? Anybody? How many have worked a full-time job? Okay. So that's pretty much everybody, all right? The theme here, and why you're all in the right room, is because at some point, you apply to an organization, whether it be a school, whether it be a, a fraternity or a sorority, or whether it be a company, right? And what did you do? You got dressed up, you made sure you were prepared, you wanted to make sure you did a great job of impressing so that they would select you. But I want to reframe your mind, okay? I want you, next time you go into an interview opportunity like this, to think and ask, is this place right for me? What are they going to do that shows me they are fit for me? What questions do I need to ask to make sure that this is the right place for me? Okay. Now, all of you are associated with Vanderbilt. This is one of the best academic institutions in the country. Sounds like you probably feel very good about that decision, but that doesn't always happen. Okay. 
And so it's incumbent upon all of us to know what's important and go and seek that out in any organizational work. So, hopefully you follow one of these three classifications, single and study, casually dating, maybe you're ready for a short-term contract or internship, or maybe you're ready to find the one. You want a long-term role in a company that you can love. And listen, I want to say, it doesn't mean that any job or any career is always going to be puppy dogs and lollipops. It's not. But that doesn't mean it needs to be a day-to-day -day grind that sucks the soul out of you either. And hopefully some of these tips will help you do that. All right, let's challenge the premise though first, okay? Is where you work and what you do for work important? Anybody? Yeah. You think it is? Does anybody think it's not that important? I just go to work, I make a paycheck, I go home, and that's okay. Nobody? So everybody here thinks that work is work. Good. I think it's really important. And really, when you're just getting started in your career, I think it's even 10 times more important. Here's why. So I told you I had three daughters, uh, three daughters earlier. And I've been married to my wife for 12 years. I try to model for my daughters what to expect in a partner in the future. So as well as I treat my wife is what they will expect in their partner. And if I do it poorly, then they're not going to expect very much. I think it's the same thing with your first company. Right? Whatever you learn in that company, however they treat you, if they make you feel like a number, if they make you feel like you're not valued, then you're not going to have a high expectation in the next company that's always working. So I think it's really, really important. The next thing, and I think this is really important in anything, picking a partner, picking a school, or picking a new company, what's important to you? Right? And again, these things will change over time. Right? Industry, team culture, leadership, compensation, benefits, flexibility, mission and purpose of the organization, longevity, stability, and career and personal development. Sam, yeah. what is your top motivation? My top would be potentially team culture, mission, and purpose of the organization, which mission. I think go together. Mission and purpose of the organization. Does anybody else have their top three motivations? What's the most important thing, anybody? Uh, team culture, leadership, and career and personal development. I love that. Are you further along in your career? Not really? Okay, good. I really like that though. That's a good answer. Anybody else? Mish? Uh, I would say team culture, leadership, and longevity and stability. I heard a lot of team culture. That's really exciting. And it's really hard to identify in an interview, right? You gotta do your research, but it is important. I would say that it's okay. There is no right answer here. Everybody's got their own answer. And this, again, might change. One thing I'll, I'll tell you though, whatever your top motivation is, you should ask why. I'll give you an example. Let's say that compensation is the most important thing for you. I get that. But you have to ask yourself, is it getting that compensation up front in that next offer letter? Or is it going and working somewhere where you build great relationships, they're going to develop you in a way, or maybe it's a great brand that you can use as you go forward in your career. And so you're going to make that money you want to two to three to four to five years down the line. So there's a difference between what you get right now versus what you get later on, right? And sometimes early in your career, you make decisions that are hopefully longer term. And sometimes when you're late in your career, I've already made those sacrifices. I'm ready to kind of collect what's mine. And there's no right answer there again. I just ask you to think about it, right, and reframe it. All right, so let's talk about this idea of reciprocity. Any good relationship requires some level of sacrifice, right? Anybody who's married here knows exactly what I'm talking about. It can't 100% be on your terms. In fact, most of the time, it's not even 50%, right? And that's the thing. You have to make sure that there's some level of compromise and sacrifice on both sides and mutual respect to have a long-term relationship work. And it's the same thing with your company. But I will tell you this right now, the employer and employee relationship is more fractured than it's ever been. And I think I know why. Simon Sinek has a book called Leaders Eat Last. And in that book, he gives an analogy of in 1981, there was 11,000 or so air traffic controllers that um, wanted better pay and wanted to work less hours. And this was, they were going on strike, they weren't gonna work, and this was right during the holiday time, so travel ground into a halt. It was so bad that the FAA, obviously, who employs them, and the president got involved, President Reagan at the time. And so what President Reagan did was, he laid off all 11,000 of them. And this is one of the first times in recorded corporate American history that people were let go for a short-term financial decision. And what the data shows is after that, it became much easier for layoffs to happen, right? Whether it be because the CEO didn't make his bonus, or he missed our quarterly numbers, or there's economic uncertainty in the, in the future. And so, with this happening, you can understand why the individual employee would look and say, well, I've got to look out for myself. I've got to make decisions for me and my family. So, if I'm not getting what I want, I'm going to go over here. And that's why loyalty to a company is 
I think of the past necessarily right now. If you think about grandma and grandpa, they stayed at one company for 20 to 30 years, right? That's no longer the case. And I think that lack of trust is a big reason why. And what we've seen over the last year with the great resignation is that there's more agency than ever on the employee side. And that's a great thing. But I do think that the pendulum can swing too far the other way. Because now you'll see a lot of people saying, I'm going to work here on this schedule, on this timeline for this month. Right? And again, that goes away from this idea of reciprocity. That will tip over at some point, too. So for things to be sustainable, there has to be some level of sacrifice on both sides. And that's for any relationship, and in particular in the world. So I will ask, what does anybody think is the number one correlation in job satisfaction, the number one factor? Appreciation. Appreciation, good. Anybody else? I have t-shirts. No? Okay. Appreciation is good. This is a form of appreciation is a form of this. It is actually your direct manager. I have seen situations where people are working in <laughs> shit jobs, okay? For companies that they don't believe in what they're doing, for not great pay, but they love their manager and they will never leave. And then I've seen vice versa. I've seen it where it seems like everything is great about the situation, but you hate your manager, you gotta get out of it. So I want to give you some archetypes to think about when you go into these interview processes. These are four different types of managers to watch out for. So the first one is the narcissist. So that's Miranda Priestley from the Devil Wears Prada. And so the narcissist is always thinking about one person, themselves, right? When the team does something well, they take credit, right? When there's some way to advance themselves, they're doing that. They're saying things behind floors that you don't know. This is somebody to watch out for because I've never met a great leader who didn't care more about their team than they cared about themselves. And you can pick these people out pretty quickly because they use the word I, 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 and me, me, me a lot. Beware. Next, the drill sergeant, Gordon Ramsay, Hell's Kitchen. We've all seen Gordon Ramsay yell at people. Now, this is becoming less and less of a, a leadership style. Um, command and control, authoritarian, my way or the highway. This has seemed to change over time. This was a lot more prevalent back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I think that's a good thing. But this person is abusive. This person is going to make you feel bad about yourself. They're not going to make you feel appreciated. And quite frankly, you never know where you're going to get day to day. And that can be really tough. So be on the lookout for that. The opposite of that, Michael Scott, the people pleaser. Now at first, the people pleaser, you're like, ah, I'm not sure that that's that bad. I'd rather have someone who's really nice than yelling at me. Unfortunately, work is about getting our best performance and being held to a high standard of art and being empowered to do that. And a lot of times with people pleaser, that doesn't happen. And what's worse, they avoid conflict. Okay? And they want to be your friend, rather they want to be somebody that's going to hold you to a line of account to do your best work. And by the way, if there are people pleasing with you, that probably means there are people pleasing with other people. And so sometimes them pleasing this person is going to fall on you. So you want to watch out for this too. And then lastly, that handsome devil, that's me, micromanager, back in 2014. And I'm self-aware enough to admit that I probably gripped the wheel too hard when we first started the company. And it seemed like it made sense at the end of the day. I was the owner of the company, i got to make sure this goes well, right? Hired all these early in career talent, but I did everything for them. I would jump in to solve every problem. I would tell them what to do rather than have them think how to do it. And at first it was working really good. The company was growing. But then I realized as we started to scale that I had to be involved in everything. And so I was actually not empowering them to develop, and I was hurting the company by not allowing the company to scale. Now I'd like to think that I'm a little bit better about this now. I'm not sure. Am I? Okay, a little bit. So, but it happens. You can evolve and change as leaders, and I know that I, back in 2014, I was probably more of a micromanager than I wanted. And by the way, I ask people in interviews all the time to describe your ideal manager, and 90% of the time, the first thing they say is, well, not a micromanager. Nobody likes to be micromanaged, right? So I think that's a really important thing. So how do we find out in an interview process if we're walking up against one of these monsters? Because usually you find out two weeks in, if, if not earlier, right? A couple days in, and now it's like, I've heard this so many times. Well, I took this new job, and it seemed great in the interview, and it's not great, but I can't go anywhere now. If I leave, what's going to be on my resume, I'll be there for under a year. I can't do that, so I've got to stay in this hellhole for at least a year, maybe two. That sucks. So how can we get better about identifying those things early on? So here are some questions to identify each of those different types of managers. And by the way, let me do a little segue here for questions. Questions are the most important part of an interview process. I have one client that they say, our interviews are 50% us interviewing the candidate and 50% them interviewing us. Meaning they have a framework in place where that person can come with prepared questions to make sure that they're going to work at a company that they want to be at. I think that's brilliant, okay? Not everybody can pull that off, but that's, if you have the agency, you should be able to pull it off in the interview process. So 
Take advantage of the questions. Ask good questions. If you have a bad feeling, ask about it. This is not a time to be conflict avoided, right? You want to get all the answers on the table. So, do you have any questions? I want to better understand the team and the dynamics of your group. What was the last big win for the team or accomplishment that you were really proud of? The narcissist? You'll hear I, 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 me, me, me a lot in their answer. Watch out, be careful, not good. As a manager, what are the core things you are rigid on and where do you think it's important to have flexibility? If they only have things to be rigid on and not many things to be flexible, or the things that they're flexible on don't seem all that important, they might be a drill sergeant. What is an example of adversity the team has overcome this past year? How did you handle the tough conversations and decisions through that time? If they talk about the adversity and the outcome, if they leave out the part about how they intervened and how they had to have hard conversations with their employees, probably a warning sign of a people pleaser. And then, the micromanager, thank God nobody asked me this back in 2014, what is the current team's professional maturity in your mind? Are you doing a lot of delegating or a lot of handholding? Now, there can be a reasonable explanations for this too, right? There's some context to this, right? Maybe the team is new. Maybe the team is just out of college and there has to be a little more handholding in order to prepare them to develop them. But asking this question a lot of times will give you ideas of what you're walking into and if it's going to be somebody who's going to be a micromanager. All right, so. Far be it for me to tell anybody what is important and what's not important. Well, we all have our own identities. We all have our own wants and desires and needs. But I, whenever I ask people, what are the red flags or what do you really want to understand before you take a job, I constantly hear these things. What are the office hours? What's the starting salary? How many people do they have? Oh, I have to interview with. What are the perks? I don't know if you all have heard about unlimited PTO. Unlimited PTO is a scam. I have to tell you that right now. The data says that people take less time off and burn out more with unlimited PTO. That doesn't sound very unlimited to me. What actually matters? What should you be looking for in the interview? What and who they complain about? My God, it's like a blind date, right? I mean, if somebody's getting into complaining about things and being very pessimistic and having a negative mindset, that probably means they're going to be like that all the time once you start working there. They give ambiguous answers, vague answers, and then when you drill down, they continue to give you vague and ambiguous answers. There's usually a reason for that. But they don't have that answer, but they don't want to tell you that. Lack passion. Lack passion for their work, lack passion for their company. They're not passionate, are you going to be passionate? They don't value your time. I've seen so many horror stories of people sitting in the lobby for an hour, people not showing up to interviews, people eating lunch by themselves at an interview. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody shows up a minute late to an interview, you've got to get up and walk out because they're not respecting your time. But I do think it's important that they give you an experience that's going to be similar to what you will have when you're there. If they're not valuing in the interview, I feel like it's going to be hard for them to value when you're actually working for the company. And then, of course, a lack of diversity in the organization is tremendously important. Diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of gender, diversity of religion, all of these different things are super important. So when you interview with a company, of course, you're canvassing, do they look like me? Do they think like me? Am I being exposed to new things? Those are important things, especially early in your career. You want to get exposed to many different types of thought early in your career because it helps you learn, it helps you develop. All right, so. We're gonna give scenarios real quick, okay? So I'm gonna ask for um, volunteers, and yes, I am going to give a t-shirt. I'm gonna to go to Tina first. Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. All right, so the one where you got catfished. So here's the situation, okay? You're going through an interview process, it's gone amazing, you've interviewed with everybody, you have the final interview coming up very soon, okay? You're at drinks with a friend, let's say it's Jesse, you're at happy hour, and she's like, oh man, girl, I gotta tell you. A lot of people left that company. I have two friends alone that have left in the past year. And then you go do your research on LinkedIn and you find out, you know what, there has been a lot of attrition there. So now you're going into the final interview. Everything else has been great up until this point. What do you do? Uh, well, so what I would do before heading into that final interview is try to talk to some of those people Ooh. that you found on LinkedIn. Okay. Have left and didn't have a positive experience. And then ask the kind of questions like you talked about. What were accomplishments, right? What were things that were hard that that employer said? See what they say? I love it. But I'm going to give my t-shirt to someone else. Please do. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for somebody to give a better answer than the one I had loaded, so I'll try. <laughs> I think that's great. I think that's a great thing. Reach out to the people on LinkedIn. Ask them why they might have left. You'll get some really good insight there. I also think you can ask the direct manager. You can say, I'm interested in the team I'm getting ready to join. What is the attrition level? Is that is it a long tenure team, right? They might say yes, they might say no. If they say yes, you might dig deeper and find out, did you just take on this team? Was it not the right fit? Has the organization gone in a different direction? If they say no, 
then you probably have to go ahead right there and say, you know, I notice there's a lot of attrition in the organization outside of your team. What might that be about? And hopefully, you get a direct and a good answer. All right. The one where you are having fun that need to get to know them more. I'm going to come back here. Volunteer? Okay. Uh, of course. So here's the situation. Okay. You've gone through an interview process. It's puppy dogs, lollipops, rainbows, and everything you always want. It's got the money you want. It's got the flexibility you want. The people all seem amazing. Everything is perfect. And now before you go into that final interview, you're trying to think, not all that glitters is gold. There's got to be something wrong here. How do you figure out what is, what's going on in this place? Is there anything I should be concerned about? I would want to see people, well, that's a tough one, because I really want to see people in group dynamics, sure. and I would want to see how people are treating each other. Sure. So are they really stiff, or do they seem like they actually like each other on a human level, yeah. where they took time to do that? Um, I'm not sure how I would go about figuring that out, but that's what I want to see. I like that. I think, listen, I tend to not look at companies or employees or bad or good. I just look at this fit, right? There's a perfect fit for everybody out there, whether it be in a relationship or whether it be in a company. And so, but there's always something that you're not going to love about a job. There's no question about that. The way you might ask is, when you have that opportunity to ask questions of the direct hiring manager, you might ask them, what would you be, if I'm not successful, let's say I'm hired, it sounds like there's mutual interest here, if I'm not successful in this role in a year, what would have happened? Or, if somebody was in the role previously, you might ask them, why or why not were they successful? These are good questions to kind of tease out what might be concerns without putting the hiring manager on the defensive, right? So it is a tough one, right? Sometimes you're just running forward, because you're like, stupid, you're true, I don't care, I'm just ready to go. But you should try to dig in and find out, there's gonna be something I don't like that first six weeks, what is it gonna be? And is it something I can live with? All right, last one. I think it's a pretty easy one to guess. The one where you got goes to. So again, great situation. You go through the entire interview process. They love you, you love them. I think we want to give you an offer. We're really excited. You'll hear back from our team very soon. And then you don't hear anything. No response. Two weeks later, you haven't heard back. You're still very interested. Ron, her back. Ron, her back. what would you do in this situation? I not quite sure, but I don't think it's inappropriate to reach out and ask what happened if there's anything that you can follow up with to, to make sure there wasn't just like some lack of communication. Um, basically just give your last effort to feel like you're interested. I love it. Now that's if they don't respond, which a lot of companies don't, God, that's a red flag. God, that's a bad sign. Again, I'll go back to the idea of empathy, and I think that's one of the biggest things that hiring managers are missing out on. They are interviewing a lot of times 15, 20, 25 people, and so they treat it like a printing press, right? It's like they gotta get through this interview and do this, and what they're not realizing is that person on the other side, I really need that job. I really want that job. That might be the only job they've interviewed for the last five to six years, and this is really, really important to them. And unfortunately, we see a lot of this. We see it with recruiters, we see it with TA organizations, we see it with hiring managers. So here's what I would do. I'd always recommend a thank you note. I know that sounds silly. Every time I get one from somebody that wants to work at MSH, I'm be like, ooh, I like that, right? Short and sweet, nothing too controversial, nothing too crazy. Loved our conversation, maybe put something detailed in there about the conversation. Thank you so much, I look forward to hearing back. Then, if you still don't hear back after you've done that right after the interview, I would follow up on that thank you note and say, listen, I wanted to reach out, really enjoyed our conversation a couple weeks ago. Sounds like there was mutual interest on both sides. I've got some things in the fire. I really want this opportunity, but I want to make sure I can plan. Can you let me know if we're gonna move forward with the next steps. And if not, please give me the feedback on what I did or if something else came up, because that would really help me get better going forward. Now again, I can't promise you that they're gonna to respond to that, but if they're good, they should. And listen, sometimes there's a reasonable explanation. Sometimes it's, ah, oh, we're working on budgets, or ah, oh, some of this internal referral came up. Sometimes there's a reasonable answer, right? And people don't put themselves in your shoes, so they don't always communicate that, and maybe they will if you do that. So it's not an easy situation, unfortunately. It probably happened to all of us in this room. Right? You thought it was going well, and it didn't end up going the way you want. Go get the answers you need. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about putting on a show. Worry about getting what you need from an answer perspective. And whatever you get back is a great indicator that you're either better off or that you picked the right company. All right, we're in the home stretch. Three things I want you to take away from this presentation. The first one. Know what is important to you. We talked about that. What is your motivation? Why are they, is it your motivation? Right? And constantly be rechecking it. Because again, it might be one thing in your mid-20s, and it might be something completely different when you start to have a family, 
or when you get later on in your career, okay? So the question you've got to ask yourself before you go into any process is, what is important to me? Why is it important to me? Write it down, and then go seek it out. Two, be intentional to ask questions and use resources to gather info and insights. The internet, amazing, amazing thing. A lot of downsides, but a lot of upsides. And one of the best upsides is you can find out information on pretty much anything, including companies, okay? There are a lot of great resources out there. Some people will tell you Glassdoor. Glassdoor's not bad. I will say that it's a little bit skewed in that a lot of the people who are writing on Glassdoor are the people that are upset and angry with the company, right? Not many people are like, God, I love this job. I gotta go write about it on Glassdoor. That doesn't happen, right? It's usually a face-to-face -face conversation. But still, it's a data point. LinkedIn, Indeed, talking to people that have worked at that company, those are all appropriate things. In fact, I would highly recommend reaching out to people that have worked at that company both in the past and currently and say, can I get another idea of your experience because I'm trying to make a big decision here. Research is the most important thing you can do about an interview, by the way. Companies want to hire people that care, that put in the practice and the preparation and have good, insightful questions based on things they've read. So whether it be quarterly financial numbers, if it's a public company, whether it be a big acquisition in the news, or even if it was that layoff that happened a year ago, you should be reading and asking those questions and getting to the bottom of it. And if you're getting vague and ambiguous answers, that's a good sign that you've hit a nerve point. And then last but not least, don't be scared to walk away. Whether you're at the moment where you're at an offer and you haven't got enough information and something in your gut doesn't feel right, there will be other opportunities, okay? If you're in a job right now that you do not love, I'm not saying that you need to walk out and, and say, I'm out, of, I'm out of here, but I would say that start to put the wheels in motion to find what you do want so that when you are ready and you found something that's better, you can leave. You deserve to work somewhere you love. You really do, and it's not that hard. There are places out there, it's just sometimes we sell. That happens in relationships too, right? Don't do it at work. All right, so real quickly, we do have a podcast. It's named Higher Learning. We talked to executives, CEOs, and entrepreneurs. Dina was on the podcast about a week ago. That's not gonna come out for a little while, but we ask questions that tries to drive a through line between people who are great at hiring. What is your favorite questions to ask? What are you looking for in feedback? Um, tell us about great experiences. So this is a very cool resource to learn about what executives and CEOs are looking for when they hire. And if you want to learn more about MSH, at MSH our EVP, that's Employee Value Proposition, is that your employment is more than an exchange, it's a relationship. If you're interested, please email Christopher Sioni and Tom MSH. All right, I want to thank Dina and Yessi for having us here. I want to help thank Sammy for your help on the presentation. I want to thank all of you for taking a little bit of time to be here. I very much appreciate it. Namaste. Questions. Can you speak to the interview process? Because I think uh, it's very, very hard to have one frozen frame. The question is, how how often do you bring back candidates two or three times or that you want to be brought back if you're interviewing? What's what's the longitudinal activity look like in terms of those interactions? Yeah, I love that question. So we've actually build what we call an optimal hiring process, right? When we go and we're talking to our clients, what is the optimal amount of interviews? Who should be involved in the interviews? We believe and prescribe to the rule of four. So you should have four interviews, right? You should be meeting with the hiring manager, anybody in HR, and then a panel on the team is what we typically recommend, and then the last one should be again with the hiring manager so you can get any of those questions addressed. I've seen companies that have eight, 10, 12, 13, they're doing that on purpose. It's a battle of attrition. They want to see if you can fight it out. That's not a great experience. I've seen companies do one or two. You make a lot of bad decisions with that. I find that four, as long as you're, here's the most important part, right? It can be four, it can be 10, but you've got to structure the interview properly. Here's the key. What are the requirements of the position? Behaviorally, competency-wise, experience-wise, right? And then now ask questions that map back to those requirements and make sure you're comprehensive so when you get to the end of the process, you know what you need to know about the candidate, and hopefully the candidate knows what they need to know about you. But to answer the question, I would say four interviews, and I'd like that last interview to be offsite. Lunch, happy hour, dinner, whatever it may be. I know somebody that invites, uh, you know, he's an executive, and he invites that person and their significant other to a dinner in the final interview, right? Because he wants to get to know that person. I think as much as you can do to get away from the veneer of just sitting there in the suit and answering questions and putting them in situations where you can see them interact in different ways, the better. Answer your questions, right? Anybody else? 
Thank you. Can you speak to your view of sharing equity with employees? <laughs> That's a big one. I think it's imperative for any leader to give ownership to their team, right? And I don't necessarily mean think that always has to be equity or stock, right? I think there's a lot of different things that can be put in place to give that ownership, but I think equity is probably the most important one. Now, there's lots of different forms of that. There's phantom equity, right? There's shares. I find a lot of the time, and Landon and I talk about this a lot, you gotta really read the fine print on this stuff. There's a lot of deals. I have a lot of friends, and I know a lot of people who've taken on what they thought were big equity package and packages and ended up with nothing, right? Because they didn't really know, understand the fine print. You know, listen, it's kind of a tough situation to think about, right? You're negotiating at the end, you want the job, they want you, you can push a little bit harder on what this means, but you don't want to lose out on an opportunity to be standoffish, and that can really put you in a bad spot when it comes down to that, especially if you're really counting on that. So my take is, I've done that with key employees at our company. I've done that certainly for the software side of our business. I think everybody should want that, but I think it has to be done well. It has to be done for the right people. I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can do it that you can be creative. But I think the most important thing I would say is, are you giving people a sense of ownership, whether it be a physical piece of paper that they can cash in at some point, or is it autonomy, or is it, hey, if we reach here, you get X, Y, Z. Profit sharing is another great one, right? The company does well, you do well. There's lots of different ways to do it, and it's incumbent of, as entrepreneurs and owners to think creatively. And you know what? Don't just do it in your ivory tower by yourself. Canvas the people, especially early on in the process. What's important to you? What do you want? What's going to motivate you, right? I find that it can be a really good tool, Striker. And I found that I hope people have stayed at MSH for a very long time because they love the company, they love the culture, they love the leadership. But I know at least in part, they know that there's an up, some upside and there's some, something over the rainbow that if things really go as well as we think they're gonna be, they're gonna enjoy that upside. And we have been very vanilla about it. There's nothing in it about like, it's very cut and dry. It's this, and this is what you get. And sometimes it's been to my detriment. But it's the right thing to do, especially for people that are super valuable to your organization because nobody does it alone. And anybody that thinks they do it alone, is destined to not have a very successful company. So you've got to reward and take care of the people that take care of your business. Answer that? Go ahead, sir. Did you just want to go have a one-on-one -on, -one on the side? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for first-time entrepreneurs uh, that have never written a job description on their own, they don't understand the linear process that you just mentioned, if we were to offer one source of how to stay out of trouble in hiring as a first-time entrepreneur. Is there a book, is there a workbook, is there a website that you would say, this would be the one recommendation I would make that somebody can research, read, and incorporate? Yeah, there's a couple. So there's a book called How Google Works that talks about their process. The rule of four is in there. That's obviously a very big company, but they talk about what they did from a startup to get to the point where they are. A lot of great information on there on hiring. Another book I really like, gets really technical about it, and nerds like me love it, is Hire With Your Head. That's a really good book that talks about specific things that you can do to make sure that you're hiring great people. Now I wanna talk about the job description. See, there's two things I believe, maybe you've seen it on LinkedIn. I do not believe in the resume. I do not believe in the job description. I just do not believe. I think they're 10% of the story at best. In my mind, the job description should be a marketing tool. One of the things that I believe is that recruiting shouldn't sit in HR. I think it's more marketing than it is HR. And part of that is because if you think about what you're doing in recruiting, you're going out to the market and getting people excited about your company and your job. And then when you find that great candidate, you're marketing it back internally and saying, I love this person, here's why. And so when you look at a job description, it's just like a skills box. It's like I need 10 years of project management experience and five years of integration experience, and that gets nobody excited. And that sucks, because what you need to do is you need to draw people in, right? And I don't think it needs to be a big fuzzy wuzzy document. I just think it's really important that um, you, 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 you talk about your company's mission and value, what they need for the job, what they'll get if they take this job, and where they'll learn and develop. That is what's gonna compel people to wanna to apply for your posting or to get excited about your job. So look at the job description as a marketing tool. And then with the resume, God, I hate the resume. And here's why. I mean, we have these, here's a thing. I've seen people who are good at writing the resumes and bad at writing the resumes. But this person is actually better at the job. So that sucks, right? Number two, we all have our biases when we look at a resume. Ah, oh, this person's been at three companies in four years. What should I think? Oh, there might be a story there. Maybe you should find out. Ah, oh, this person took a two-year sabbatical. They're not going to be a fit. Well, why not? Maybe they are the right fit for the job. And so I actually think that the resume is one of the biggest forms of conscious and unconscious bias we have. What I prefer is 
you have a resume, and then you combine it with an intake on a job. Here's what we need out of the job, right? And now you put together a profile of a candidate that talks to those requirements. This person has this. They have this behavioral profile. They, have, they worked at this type of company. And that's what you need to know. Not that you know, they worked at the Waffle House for two years you know, back then. It's that they actually did this role most recently. That's what's important to the job. And so what we try to do is we try to look beyond the resume. And we try to create this profile of our candidates that talks about what you said was important in the role and then how does that fit with the person. Unfortunately, we're still, as part of what our technology is going to do, is going to push some of these artifacts out of the way. But I think you know, if you just go online, go to Google and pull a job description, I think you're going to have a hard time getting the right people into your company. Last thing I'll say about what you said. Obviously, you know this. At the beginning, you have to hire the right people. Okay? Um, it is really the difference in the make or break in your company and your startup. And so what I would always do is hire for behavior. Because that person, my number one, my first employee, my second employee, 12 years later, still work at MSH. And they didn't have a lot of skills coming out. They were trained in skills. They're experts now. They're amazing. They're better than me in a lot of ways. But they had the right behavior. They had the right character. And that is what allowed them to be at the company for 12 years and to be as successful as they are. So I would really focus on, can I go on a six hour car ride with this person? Does I not want to kill them afterwards? That's actually really important. Do I get along with this person? Do, I believe, do we have the same values? Do we want similar things? Those are the type of things, especially when you have a startup. If you like, you know, you have a baby and then you're not really qualifying the babysitter, right? You need to make sure if your baby's spending time with this person, is this somebody that I feel good about? Is this somebody I trust? Is this somebody that's aligned with me? And so I, I think especially, number employee number one, two, three, You've got to focus on character and do everything you can to find out that character, even outside of just the interview. Can I add one thing there? Oh, please. Something that we do at MSH to try to continue that process as we've grown, and it's something that's so important to how Oz sees the success of the company, is we incorporate in that four-step interview process internally, we have a cultural interview. So we do an HR screen, and then before they even go to the business, we have a cultural behavioral interview to really understand who that full human being is that'd be showing up to work, what motivates them, what makes them who they are, um, what is their going to be their unique adversity, what, how are they going to receive challenges and feedback, um, and, and sorting that out to make sure that they're aligned to who we are, what we need out of them, can we best service them and show up for them before we're then having them apply an interview to the specific role. So that cultural fit, we've really tried to make a through line throughout our hiring process as we've scaled. And she owns that cultural interview for our company, and if they do not get past her, I will never hire them. It does not matter. It does not matter. You have to have that level of trust and alignment of this person understands what works here, and sometimes she knows better than me. She's done a really good job of helping us get great people in our organization. Anything else? Any issue with questions? Yeah, I was going to speak on um, and ask you, you talked about the four interviews, but at what point from a candidate's perspective, I'm interviewing with a place, We've done three interviews over two and a half weeks. At, at that point, when you're talking to the hiring manager, what are you telling them on candidate experience? Are you talking to them about, hey, this is taking a little too long? You know, what are you, what are you bringing up? What are you talking about? Um, yeah. the Time in recruiting is the enemy, right? Especially, like, I don't know, about a year ago, if you know how hot the market was, people were getting calls, left and right, people had off, six offers in hand, right? And if you really, you know, they say the war on talent, I hate that analogy, but the reality is, is that if you want to be a company that gets best-in-class talent, like Couture Technology, right? If you want to get best-in-class technologists, right? You can't be dawdling. You have to make sure. So here's what I would say. If they need to have five, six, seven, eight interviews, my question would be, what are the questions you're asking in interview one, two, three, four that you feel you don't feel good enough? And by the way, if you don't feel good enough after interview four, that might not be the right fit for you, right? So I think it's really important that there's a structured interview process that you adhere to time and time again. Because when you try to look at different hiring manager standards from A to B to C and everyone's doing things differently, you have nothing to compare it against. So it's really important that there's a structured interview process that takes the requirements in the hand, Make sure the questions are aligned. Make sure that all the people who are giving the feedback are aligned on what the definition of success is. And then let people know time is the enemy. If you go three weeks, four weeks, that's up to you. But you might lose a candidate. And I think we all know that the right person in the right role, man, that can make such a big difference, right? So when you think about it that way, you're going to take more thought. It's like they say, measure twice, cut once, right? You're going to take a lot more thought beforehand on your interview process so that you make sure that when you get there, you know you can move right away. But be careful. 
be quick, but don't be hasty, right? Because if you're just moving fast and you're leaving things out, that's also gonna be a problem, right? So I would advise anybody that's doing any hiring, have a timeline in mind, have an objective in mind, make sure you get everything you need answered to make a good decision and make that decision. Because otherwise you're gonna lose great talent. Because here's the thing, great talent doesn't stick around for long. Someone else is gonna find out what you find out. Nobody's a secret, especially with LinkedIn and all these different things out there. If you think somebody's awesome and you've done your due diligence, make the hire. And that's what I would tell every hiring manager. So I'll talk to us a little bit about how do you vet or select like your customers that you work with these businesses? Like what are you looking for in a company that you're gonna hire for? It's a great question. That was different the first days of the company than it is now, right? First days of the company, you wanna pay us? Okay, come on in, right? Over time, you start to develop a culture, you start to develop standards, right? And so I want to work with, listen, you know what sucks about recruiting is that everybody thinks they're amazing at hiring. Everybody does, and the data does not back that up. I've never met one hiring manager. Yeah, I'm not very good at hiring. I'm very bad at it, actually, right? So everybody, it's something that everybody thinks they can do and do well. So it makes it hard when you come in and say, well, I've kind of been doing a lot of this, kind of an expert in this space, kind of an advisor in this space. And I don't mean that about me, I mean that about our entire company. And so. I have a hard time, like, let me put it this way. I would never be talking to a supply chain VP and then be like, well, you know, your 3PL is not really working all that well. I would really look at maybe doing something in Central America, right? Why would I come and try to give my expertise to somebody that's doing it at a level that I can only hope to, right? But then it's never looked back that same way. It's like, oh, well, you might be an expert in this space. We should listen to you, right? And so I want to work with customers that are progressive, that are employee first, that are ethical, and that know why I and our team is in the room, right? We're not there because we can do your job, but we are here because we can't do our job. And so I might be sitting across from you know, the CIO of Salesforce, and I can't tell him anything about how to build an information technology organization at a company that size. But I'm in that room because I know how to hire, and I know talent. So I know that, and so I hope that if I'm sitting there that I can give that expertise, and it's about it. So that's what I'm looking for out of the customer. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.